What's going on, my brethren of the non-cloth? Uh, my name is Brain Smasher, and how about we do a spin after spin? Spin after spin is the Judas Priest song. This is a take on that, where you talk about you're spinning wheels, and you're spinning albums in your car. What have you been listening to in your car? I got a stack of shit I've been listening to in my new car! I'm loving this new car. I love it. It's got a CD player. And I love metal. So, let's talk about what I've been listening to in my fucking new car. Um, let's see here. A couple of things are new. A couple of things are old. Um, let's see here. First thing and most important release in this whole pile. I really want you to check this out. If it sounds interesting to you. Because this band is criminally under appreciated um, and they were even in their inception this is morbid insulter Sweden is the origin uh, this release is called funeral mysticism um, this is a double disc set both of the discs are in my uh, wallet actually we're back here um, double disc set uh, discography of all their demos unreleased material um, couple of little uh, hidden gems here and there and this is fucking infernal nuclear devastating bestial fucking thrash metal from Sweden uh, totally in the vein of Niflheim but I kind of feel like where Niflheim kind of went south a little bit changed styles a little bit after the uh, Devil's Force album is that what it's called uh, the one with the demon and the fire on it. Anyways, I love the first two Niflheims after that, and eh, not so much. But these guys really take that template to a whole other fucking level. Um, you know, at first, Glisten, it sounds obviously quite a bit like Niflheim, but um, on their best tracks, which I found uh, was... Uh, was it the first disc? I'm not sure. This packaging, again, really sucks. Um... There's just, there's no, no information on here. There's nothing telling you what demos or albums these are from. So that fucking sucks. But anyways, the material on it is so fucking good. Bestial, just thrash metal, just, I don't know. They, they take that template that I feel like a lot of bands do, but they just drive it up 16 more notches. So much faster, so much more intense, so much more just riveting and bombastic. Uh, but also they don't rely on just straightforward blast beating like a lot of modern sort of thrash influenced bands do they kind of keep it on the ground level but just explode left and right check out that um so the reason this is kind of important is that the main dude um not sure what his name was but he passed away uh actually killed himself i think in 2010 maybe 11 so this material spans their uh, discography from only, I think, like 2005 to 2010, I want to say, five or six years or so. And so the best material, the latest material, no, I'm sorry, the best material on here is from 2006. That was my favorite stuff. So, um, God, I am really talking in circles all over the place here. Anyways... Dude was 19 when he wrote the best material on this fucking thing. You should be able to pick this up on Discogs. Uh, it pops up every once in a while. Kind of pricey because it did come out in 2013. And because it's a double disc set. Uh, I Hate Records put this out uh, in 2013. So definitely pick this up. It's totally something that I think Health Headbangers would release on a double or triple LP set or something like that. It totally deserves to be released on vinyl but it's not so pick this fucking thing up morbid insulter funeral mysticism uh next sorry about the audio by the way um usually i do my audio from my laptop through a professional microphone but i'm not gonna haul my laptop out here into my car so i'm sure the sound is gonna be god awful um that, you know that doesn't really make any sense god is awful so what is What's like the atheist version of God Awful? You ever wonder about that? Next is Visigoth with The Revenant King. These guys are from Utah. 
traditional heavy metal, maybe a little bit of sort of power metal influence. Um, the whole reason I ever checked this band out is because Jake Rogers of Caladan Brood sings in this band. And uh, there's a lot of that sort of uh, songwriting, melodic sort of tonality, I guess, um, followed through into this band, uh, vocally, of course. But the songs that they write are super great, just fist-pumping, memorable tunes with awesome, just memorable, catchy choruses. You'll be singing along to this thing in no time. Uh, Metal Blade put this out in 2013. Great packaging. Um, it's got a painting on the cover by Chris Verwimp. I haven't seen many covers out of him. Uh, but yeah, Metal Blade did a good job on this, and I really look forward to a future release from this band. They did some pretty extensive touring after this came out in support of the album, but I feel like it did kind of fall on deaf ears maybe a bit. Um, so I'm hoping that they're working on a new release here soon. It would be to their benefit, because this is kind of one of those bands that gets, I think, potentially lost in the mix pretty easily. There's fans of, like, there's just a lot of bands kind of doing this kind of thing, and I feel like they're doing it pretty mediocrely. And this just really shines through, for me anyways, uh, with better songwriting, amazing vocals by Jake Rogers. Dude is a fucking, one of the most talented singers in all of metal, um, certainly the United States as well. Proud to have him from our uh, neck of the woods. Um... Next, here's a non-metal release. The Big Gun Down by John Zorn. This is John Zorn playing the music of Ennio Morricone, uh, who is a pretty well-known Italian movie scorer. Um, this is fucking great. It's got a ton of uh, different players on this. Uh, Fred Frith, Bill Frizzell, Diamanda Galas, uh, Melvin Gibbs, Shelley Hirsch, Vernon Reed plays on this. This came out in, uh, uh, fuck me. I'm going to guess maybe late 80s, I think. Uh, but John Zorn is a musical genius, plays saxophone. Um, most of his stuff is kind of unlistenable. His uh, output is insanely, insanely over the top. He's just got too many records, so it's really hard to find or figure out where to dive into his discography at. So this is a great fucking place to start. Also, it kind of gets you familiar with the music of Ennio Morricone, who's also a brilliant composer. And the playing on this, the instrumentation on this, is just through the fucking roof. It's incredible. There's a lot of uh, stuff I haven't read here. I'm not going to lie and say that I've <laughs> gone through this. I don't know if it's a quick interview or something about his love for Ennio Morricone, I would guess. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, one of my favorite go-tos when I'm not in the mood for metal. It's just really zany, wacky, crazy, soundtracky kind of stuff. Um, and it just really kind of scratches an itch of for like frantic sort of crazed uh, non-metal for me anyways. Uh, next is a band that I have been meaning to listen to again after many, many years of just uh, thinking their albums were shit. Uh, we were on a live stream with Eric Bauer, Marty Worm, and I think Bog Phantom a couple of months ago. Hell, it's probably even been a year by now. And uh, <coughs> I think Eric mentioned Gates of Ishtar. And I was like, wait a minute, I have two of their albums. And uh, ever since then, I've been meaning to put them on. And I feel like I keep seeing their name pop up here and there. Um, Instagram and YouTube and shit like that, and I just have kept meaning to put these on again. Dreading doing so, though. For some reason, I just had it in my head that th this album and another one, um, the one that came after this, um, being so terrible. For some reason, I guess the last time I listened to them, I was must have been just knee-deep in a fucking necrotic black metal sort of phase. Um, and when I'm in the mood for that sort of thing, in the winter time or something, or if I'm pissed off or whatever. Um, this kind of stuff to me, which is highly musical, super melodic, insanely talented. I don't want fucking anything to do with it at that time. So, uh, it's been a long time since I put on A Blood Red Path from Gates of Ishtar. 
And uh, I feel like lately in the last year or two, I've been really digging more melodic stuff with lots of uh, harmonies going on and shit like that. So I, I don't know. I, it's weird that I had this fucking gem sitting there on my shelf being completely, completely neglected. This fucker rips, rages. There's all kinds of fucking tasty riffs all over the place, and I've been really digging the hell out of jamming this one lately. Um, next, I picked this up, and I did a, mention it in a video a little while ago, Cold of Ages by Ash Borer, a uh, really killer live band, um, and I wasn't sure how their material would fare with me after their demo. Um, I, I'm not really familiar with their discography all that much, but uh, I had some reservations about how good this would be. But upon buying it uh, in Chicago a couple weeks ago for just a couple of bucks, this fucker rules. Totally hypnotic black metal from Port? No, California. Um, great, great stuff. It's got that sort of like circular whirring sort of hypnoticism that a lot of bands, I feel, um, try to pull off. And it's something that has to be pulled off with a great amount of taste and delicate touch to it because obviously doing the same thing over and over and over again is pretty easy to pull off. Making it worth listening to is actually something that's hard to do. These guys are champs at it and most other bands are not. In my humble opinion. Next, uh, this fucking album rules super hard. Balsagoth with Battle Magic. This is the last album from them that I actually like. It's like, I just kind of always think of them as having not existed after this, but it's not true. They have uh, The Power Cosmic and Atlanian Ascendant and the Keithonian Chronicles after this one. Three or four records that came out after this, and for some reason I've just never really been able to get into them as much as this one. This is super theatrical and bombastic, orchestral as all fucking get out, and really there's so little like in common with other black metal bands of the period and of their area. Uh, they're from the UK. A criminally underrated band. Most people don't even listen to this fucking band, but I highly recommend giving them a second, third, fourth, or fifth chance if you've heard of them and not checked them out. Album cover fucking rules. They just reissued this for some fucking god-awful reason uh, with a different album cover, and I think they remastered the audio. Booklet is fucking beautiful as well. Also, many, many years ago, a friend of mine... How did this, how did this fucking start? I don't even remember how this joke started, but anyways, I have one of the longest song titles ever uh, memorized. It's the Dark Liege of Chaos is unleashed at the ensorcelled shrine of Azura Kai, the splendor of a thousand swords gleaming beneath the blazon of the Hyperborean Empire. Part 2. There's a video of me and the singer Byron from Balsagoth reciting that album title. Fucking great. Sorry, song title. On my channel if you want to check it out. I'll put the link below. Next, uh, uh, I just always listen to this album every once in a while. Eucharist, A Velvet Creation. Brilliant fucking record. This is some early Swedish sort of blackened death metal. Um, if you're into dissection, this is totally your jam. Um, it's been a while since I put this on, so it was nice kind of uh, refresher. This is one of those albums, I guess, for me, I hold it in such high esteem that I actually don't listen to it very often. I don't ever want to get sick of it. I want to act, I want to think of this as a special treat that I get to listen to when uh, I feel the need. Um, it's just a remarkable fucking amazing record. It's incredibly unique, even though it sounds quite a bit like other bands from Sweden, melodically and harmonically. Um, I, I just think his writing and the style and the passion um, exuding throughout it is just unparalleled. There's really no other record like that. Um, next, and the last three, I picked these up yesterday. I went down to visit my grandmother, my dear, dear grandmother, and there's this record store down there, and they have a shit ton of garbage vinyl 
um, and their CD selection is really fucking weird. They'll have fucking Spin Doctors CDs for $8 used. Where, like, I don't know if, what it's like where you're from, but Spin Doctors CDs are garbage and probably shouldn't sell for more than a quarter in a, a resale bin or something like that. So it's like this strange sort of, like, step back in time where I'm not sure how this fucking record store is staying in business if they're asking $8 for Spin Doctors. Um, but then there's Shania Twain in the cutout bin for $4. There's all kinds of just fucking cheesy, like, 80s glam butt rock, your fucking Axel Rudy Pelly shit. Just everything is, like, eight fucking dollars across the board. And it's like, who the fuck would ever buy this thing for more than a dollar? Anyways, I picked up three CDs there for eight dollars a piece. Uh, and it's a band I really don't like very much, but I, I've always felt like I should. Um, a lot of my friends are into these bands, this band, and um, so many bands are influenced by them that I like. Talking about, what are they called? Agalock. <laughs> uh, really difficult to elaborate without just pooping on a lot of my friends' tastes and dreams. But you know what? I already had uh, two of their other albums, the Pale Folklore and The Mantle. Decided, hey, why not pick up all three of them in one shot? Not a bad thing. And I, you know, I just thought, you know, what if I'm missing something? What if the later albums are better and I would like them? Uh, these two have a friend of mine, Aesop Decker, playing drums on them, so, you know, I'd own them. Uh, the packaging on them is really great. Um, my buddy at Hammerheart made a beer dedicated to this album, uh, and it's a great beer. I just have, there's so many reasons that I should be into Agalock, but I can't fucking get into them. Um, I listened to all three of these albums yesterday on my drive home. And, uh, Ashes Against the Grain was my favorite. It's the least annoying of these three, but I still feel like the things that piss me off about The Mantle and Pale Folklore are just really all over the place, and mainly the thing I can't stand is how fucking cheesy the vocals are in this goddamn band. Ruins the fucking music. Um, so, yeah, really that's like the main caveat to them. There's, like, these fucking... He enunciates so much, and he isn't necessarily singing or screaming. It's like... I, I don't even want to fucking try to pretend like I know how to do what he's doing. But it's not strenuous. It's not intense. It's not fucking passionate. It doesn't sell me on anything that you're telling me in these god-awful records. Um, they're not terrible. Musically, they are pretty... You know, they're doing some cool stuff. I just feel like what they're doing is so watered down and just basic. It's just basic fucking metal to me. I don't know what, how else to put it. I don't know how to get into it. I don't know why. There's this one band that everyone's fucking nuts about that I'm just fucking bored to tears with. You know, so many people will probably use that fucking argument with where they say, like, you wouldn't have Falls of Raros without... Agalock, and that's fine, um, you wouldn't have mashed potatoes without raw potatoes, and I don't fucking sit around eating raw potatoes, you wouldn't have mashed potatoes without potatoes, and you wouldn't have potatoes without soil and the ground, and the sunlight that makes them grow, so fuck you, Agalock is mediocre at best, that's, that's what I'm sticking to, that's what I've been listening to in my awesome car, thanks for joining me, let me know what you've been listening to in your car or on your bike, if you are uh, one of those folks. I have a bike. I like riding bikes sometimes, too. Uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks for joining me.